everyone. I hope you're all staying safe and warm inside today. The snow is starting to melt, uh, but I'm guessing there's still some slick spots out there. So, uh, we're going to pick back up. Um, so this might be a little bit of a review for some of you, because one class got farther than the other. Um, but we're going to start today with the Boston Massacre. So, as you remember from last class, tensions are building. People are becoming more and more angry about the treatment that they're receiving from the British government. They're becoming especially angry with the parliament. So one of the things that we see in this period with this tension is that there's an increased amount of violence between colonists and British soldiers who are there uh, in the colonies, especially in Boston. There's a lot of anger in Boston, especially. Uh, remember, Boston is the site of the Dominion of No England, so they have this history of the British government kind of coming in and treating them very harshly, um, in their opinion, anyway. And we, uh, we have a culture of people that um, are part of the colonies because they don't really want to be uh, strongly governed. So you have uh, lots of anger in Boston, especially. So much so that the British dispatch additional troops to Boston in 1768. And many of these troops uh, end up taking part-time jobs uh, in Boston, um, which keeps many colonists out of the job market. So there is additional anger here as well. There's this idea that the British are coming over here, they don't, the colonists don't want them there, and they're also taking their jobs. Uh, in March of 1770, this tension comes to a head. Uh, a group of colonists who's very angry begins throwing snowballs, some of them filled with rocks, uh, at a group of British soldiers uh, guarding a fort in Boston, and someone fires. We don't actually know who. Historians have come up with various hypotheses about who uh, was the first uh, person to fire their, their gun. But what happens is that once one person fires, other people also fire. Now, this is called the Boston Massacre, but what really, uh, the death toll is really actually very small. There's only about five deaths, um, but colonists call this a massacre, and they talk about this as sort of a great violation of their liberty uh, and of their ability to, to do what they want, to be independent. So this helps, again, increase that tension, even though the death toll in reality is really quite low, um, mostly because guns are very inaccurate and very unreliable in this period. So, in 1773, uh, Parliament is still trying to kind of consolidate authority. There's still a lot of problems, and a lot of those problems are still coming from Boston. Boston really becomes the hotbed of revolution. Uh, where people in Boston are very, very active and very, very vocal about their opposition to the British government. So, in an attempt to consolidate authority, Parliament, remember the British version of Congress, allows the British East India Company to have a monopoly on tea sales. They basically pass a law that says all tea in the colonies is going to have to be bought through the British East India Company. Now the price that the British East India Company sets is actually lower than the tea that was smuggled in. So in some ways it's very similar to the Sugar Act. The price that the British government is providing is actually a better price uh, for people than what smugglers were charging. But again, Americans don't see things that way. The colonists don't see this as a good maneuver, something that's going to lower the cost. They see this as something that is going to sort of lull them or trick them into paying taxes. The Sons of Liberty, who are very active in Boston throughout this period, intimidated merchants. Uh, they threatened them. Um, they told them that they would come and destroy their shops if they stole the British East India Key. So this is something, um, the Sons of Liberty are kind of a gang of thugs uh, at this point. They also would prevent ships from unloading cargo, unloading tea that was, was made by the British East India Company. Now, in response, the governor of Massachusetts threatened to use an army to enforce uh, this law. Um, and so in response, the Sons of Liberty barred board a ship called the Dartmouth. Uh, and they throw 342 chests of tea into the harbor. So they board the Dartmouth, they throw 342 chests of tea 
into harbor. All told, this ruins about 10,000 pounds of tea. So about 10,000 pounds of tea totally ruined by this, um, which is a cost in modern dollars of about $800,000 uh, that is just gone. It's in the harbor. Um, so as you can imagine, this is not uh, going to be very, very popular with the British. So um, you can see a cartoon here of, the, uh, of this. Uh, this is the picture of the act there. Um, so, when news of this tea party reaches London, Parliament responds with the Coercive Acts. So the Coercive Acts are often also called the Intolerable Acts. So if you see them uh, in your book as Intolerable Acts, Coercive and Intolerable are the same thing. Um, it just depends who's talking in your primary source document, which term they use. The Coercive Acts are an attempt to punish Boston. Uh, and really Massachusetts in general. Uh, they closed the port in Boston. They outlawed representative government in Massachusetts. No more town meetings, no more colonial legislature, none of that. And they also passed a quartering act. So the quartering act, what this means, it has nothing to do with our modern quarters, nothing at all. Uh, what this meant is that British troops could be housed in your home you could be forced to accept British troops living in your home with you, um, which is very, very upsetting for people. Uh, if you can imagine the US government attempting to force uh, modern Americans to house soldiers, people they didn't know, uh, you can imagine the reaction. And they also made it illegal uh, to hold trials. So if you were convicted, you were arrested for doing something wrong, your trial was actually to be held outside of Massachusetts. There were no trials within the city of Massachusetts. What this does, especially in Massachusetts and our other northern colonies, is this solidifies support for the revolution. People begin looking at this situation and saying, maybe this isn't going to get better. Maybe we shouldn't continue to accept this. And this act in particular, the Coercive Acts or Intolerable Acts in particular, are really sort of the, the death net uh, for the relationship between Great Britain and the colonies. They're really sort of uh, the end of the relationship being, uh, being seen as salvageable for many people. So that sort of ends our lead up. We are going to shift now to talk about the revolution. So uh, we've talked a lot about how this kind of grows, this resistance sort of grows over a period of several years. In 1774, we have uh, one of the first sort of colonial wide uh, movements uh, to sort of do something about this. So this is the first Continental Congress. So the first Continental Congress meets in 1774 uh, and there are delegates from every single colony except Georgia, which doesn't have a very big population at this point, so that, that's okay. Um, but every colony sends representatives and they get together and they create a document that is called the Suffolk Resolves. So you can see how to spell it here. So the Suffolk Resolves were a resolution that declared that the intolerable or coercive acts were unconstitutional. So it says the, the coercive intolerable acts, whichever name you're using, they're illegal. You can't do that. And they called for citizens to arm themselves uh, and to continue to boycott British goods. And this is the first time that you have a call for militarizing. This is the first time that we see a call um, people are starting to think maybe this is going to become a violent confrontation. So what happens after this is that in Massachusetts, the legislature continues to meet uh, despite the ruling of the British that legislatures weren't allowed to meet in Massachusetts. They keep meeting anyway, and they form a committee of safety. So they form a committee of safety, and the committee of safety in Massachusetts stockpiles weapons, and they also organize militias, which become the Minutemen. And this model, using a committee of safety that is going to help stockpile weapons and then organize militias, is something that we're going to see with other colonies down the line as well. But Massachusetts is the first place it really starts. Now, Sir Thomas Gage, the British commander in Boston, 
uh, hears about this militarizing. He hears about what's going on, and he is not happy. He sends out troops to Lexington and Concord, which are two small communities in Massachusetts that happen to be where many of these stockpiles of weapons uh, were being kept. So he sends troops out to go to Lexington and Concord. Along the way, he captures two of the major leaders uh, of the Sons of Liberty, John Hancock here, Samuel Adams, not uh, actually associated with the beer, uh, and they, um, they are asked where these weapons are. They're asked where these are. They stall uh, for, uh, for several, uh, several days. Um, but what happens eventually is that um, people are notified. Now the famous, uh, the famous sort of story is that Paul Revere um, hears the, sees the lantern in the window that says that the British are coming as the prearranged signal and he rides all through the night and warns everybody and he gets all the credit. Paul Revere, big hero. Um, we actually have discovered uh, through the years that Paul Revere was only one of the riders who was uh, recruited to warn that the British were on their way. Um, so Paul Revere certainly is important, um, but actually there are a number of other riders, including uh, a woman, a blacksmith's daughter. We know very little about her, but we do have reports of her ride, which was actually significantly longer um, than Paul Revere's ride, but of course, as a woman, she's not recognized. Um, so, the British begin uh, marching towards Lexington and Concord. Revere and the other riders warn the Minutemen. They gather and assemble. The British arrive at Lexington first. So, Lexington over here. Uh, they arrive in Lexington first. And the militia was actually in the process of disbanding. They had decided Lexington wasn't a good place to fight. They were in the process of uh, sort of disbanding and uh, working on rearranging for a different location that would be better for their fighting. Um, but what happens is when the, when the British arrive, uh, they immediately fire on the militia, uh, which kills and injures about 18 colonists. So about 18 of our colonial militia are either dead or very seriously injured. Now, the British continue along the road to Concord, and this is an error. error. So you can see the road to Concord here. Concord is over in here, off the map a little bit. So they continue to Concord, but all along the way, the militias that had been formed hide in the woods, and they shoot uh, the British soldiers as they're riding down the road. Um, and this has a very, very high death toll. It's really hard to shoot somebody back when there's a bunch of trees in the way. So the colonists use the landscape to their advantage uh, and end up killing about 273 British soldiers along this route. Now the British are successful in getting to Concord where the major weapons stash was and destroying it. But this, uh, this, these battles, the battles of Lexington and Concord, um, these are often called the shot heard round the world. Um, and they really kick off the revolution. After this, it's gonna be really, really hard for either side to back down. In Massachusetts, um, the Second Continental Congress gathers together and they assume the role of a national government. And at this point, they send out what is called the Olive Branch Petition. And this is sort of the last effort. This is the last letter that says, please, please, please do better. We still love you. We just need you to be a better government. Um, they pledge their loyalty to the king and they asked him to end the violence, to stop the violence against the colonists. But they also establish an army that is led by George Washington. So there is a knowledge at the Second Continental Congress that war may come. Um, and there are people at the Second Continental Congress that are honestly hoping for war to come. So um, this ends part one of the video. I will post a second part uh, in just a few minutes.